Welcome to Onto Something. So in this episode of Onto Something, we speak to Carla Pretorius. She is the captain of the South African netball team. And what really stood out for me from this conversation is her absolute focus on hard work over talent. It's been said many times that uh, hard work beats talent if talent doesn't work hard. But she just reinforced that idea to us with you're not necessarily born as this uh, spectacular netball player or spectacular anything. But if you put your mind to it, you can achieve anything. And another definite highlight for me is the fact that she's has such a focus on South Africa and the country and really bringing using netball and her talent to to lift up the country and other people. Awesome conversation and we hope you enjoy the episode. Our very first guest is a South African netballer and just general baller, Carla Pretorias. Um, Carla plays the position of wing defense. I can already see you a bit shy when someone starts reading your accolades. <laughs> uh, wing defense and girl defense for the Sunshine Coast Lightning in the Aussie Super Netball League, where they won consecutive premierships in 2017 and 2018. And the team also named a player of the year for the 2020 season. She also has a long history with the South African national team, the Spar Pretias, who finished fourth at the 2019 Vitality Netball World Cup held in Liverpool. Despite them missing the podium, Carla was named player of the tournament, cementing her position as the best defender in the world. And in addition to these accolades, she also has a master's in dietetics, your difficult word for Afrikaans, Boiki, <laughs> from the University of the Free State and is currently doing a diploma in sports management through UNISA. Oh, is that all, all of that correct? It's all, all, yeah. always interesting. I've just finished, or middle of last year, finished my diploma oh, in so management. So I'm currently doing no academics. So no academics, <laughs> yes. just focusing on life now. Mm. Then I guess, um, I mean, one of the questions that come to mind from my perspective is like, why are you in Bloemfontein of all places currently? Is it lockdown or? Um, well, it's um, so usually, just to give a bit of a background, our season in Australia um, usually starts beginning of May, end of April, so around that time. So we were actually supposed to go back beginning of February, but due to everything that's going on, um, we're only able to get back to Australia um, beginning of March. So I'll return in two weeks or go back in two weeks, but I'm not complaining about this extra month in, at home and in Bloemfontein. So... Um, usually we go back beginning of February where then we start our pre-season and then the season would start beginning of May okay. in April and then our season would run for about 18 weeks so by our, so t- around September we finish our season and then we usually head back home with home South Africa and then <laughs> we'll compete in a few international games for um, our country wherever it is and then um, November, December, January is kind of off season. Um, so just to give you a bit of an idea how the year runs. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got no perspective for, for that sort of thing. And when you say um, Bloemfontein is home, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you weren't born in Bloemfontein. Though. No, so I was born in East London, um, in okay. Eastern Cape. Yeah. Um, so I just lived there for about two years and then basically grew up in Pretoria where I went to school and preschool or primary school, high school. And then I came to Bloemfontein when I started my studies. Um, why Bloemfontein? Sorry, I have to ask. Like, why Bloemfontein of all places? It feels um, well, unlikely. We always had a soft spot for Bloemfontein. So uh, my, my dad grew up here. So he was very well known, um, knew um, Bloemfontein very well. And when we were younger, um, they would always come and drop us here with my grandparents for two weeks and then oh, we'll stay okay. and we just fell in love with Bloemfontein. So um, by the time we had to decide where we want to go and study, um, a part of it was we knew the place and it was a place we felt very comfortable and happy to live in. But also the Nepal opportunities here was quite good um, by yeah. the time I, I was first year. So um, yeah, what a great place to be. If I if I if I ever had to do it again, I'll do it exactly the same. That was one of the best decisions I made was to come to, to, come to Bloemfontein. So yeah. Uh, often, I mean, I also have a bunch of friends. Obviously, come from like various places to to come and study mm. in Bloemfontein, and they always say that you cry twice. Once when you come into Bloemfontein and one when definitely. you have to leave Bloemfontein. <laughs> yeah, so it's, like, just it's a, one of those places that creeps into your heart. Definitely. It's just a special place. Um, the people, the community feel, um, 
and the great university and also the netball. So, and we had family here. So it was just a whole bunch of things that made it worth coming in, um, really um, made that journey and the current journey we're on still special. And then, I mean, I know, so, so the, the way that I know you to some extent, I mean, we, we met now for the first time, was uh, your husband was my, or one of the, the full tracker, mm. like, uh, officer, I suppose. It's, I don't even know what the English word for that would be. Yeah, yeah very passionate about <laughs> exactly. so, the full trackers. I always, because fr- coming from Pretoria, you don't, we don't know full trackers. So it was something new for us when we came here and um, obviously got to know what it is when we came to Bloemfontein. Um, so obviously not knowing all the terms, I would always tell people like v- Werner is a commando. But not knowing a commando <laughs> yeah. is a whole bunch of people. I was always, always thinking commando is like this leader and the head of the pack. He was a head of the pack. And then he would always tell me, no, wait, it's the wrong word to <laughs> use. But yes, so um, obviously met Werner and that's through him that I got connected with you yes exactly um yeah so i met him one of the good or also one of the reasons why i'm happy about the blue fountain yes, move definitely yeah i mean it's uh, as you said now about flip trackers not being well known in like other areas of the country i always need to sort of defend myself against my friends because it is in other areas of the country but it tends to be the weird kids who do it there while in the in the free set i found it's more like it's it's a, it's a bit wider like I, I, don't, I wasn't a rock star at school but uh, i mean it's, it tends to be the but like the people that comes out of four tracker is is really the main cement of fulak um yeah. i think one thing that the free state i think did right was that the four trackers was part of the part of your school yeah so we're in Pateng or Pretoria, it was like a bite me activity. So you had to go, it was outside school hours or um, wasn't part of the school. You had to go to a, I, I don't know what you call it, like where they. Like a community they, center sort yes, of place. Yes, where they like did that. it. So you, I, I think if it was part of the school, it would definitely be something people would um, most likely join. Yeah. And so, yeah, we, we spoke about that and now you guys met then at Varsity, I suppose? Yeah, so cool. we knew each other. Um, we always knew about each other. Um, and then basically when he finished his study and that same year he went abroad to do his master's in Maastricht. But that same year we kind of met, met or really connected. Yeah. Um, so I was still studying and he was then on his way um, Yo, overseas. That, so that's a tough one. Hey? Exactly, but that was the... A taste the, of love. I know, but... Yes, it was, um, but it was kind of like, um, if you look at our whole journey, the year after or the year, two years after, I then went abroad to play netball. So we kind of were, that was the first of many yeah. years being apart, but I feel like we stood the, um, st- or the, the got test. through it. Yes, yeah. the test. Um, so just an interesting fact by the time we got married in 2017 the five years we were together we were half of it away from each other yes that is insane yeah it's it's also interesting to me um because again i I don't even know him that well we we did some of some fur trackers together but um it's I, i find it cool that someone who obviously has such a big passion for um like south africa and the country um, it, it feels like a difficult one to navigate between him sort of not being forced to go overseas, but obviously pursuing his dreams and then also supporting mm-hmm. you um, in, in your dreams. Like, because I, I always just see you guys when you're in South Africa, you always go, like going to these uh, yeah. small towns and things. So obviously a lot of love for the country. Definitely. Um, how did it feel like leaving the country that first time? And does it feel different when you leave it, leave it now? It was definitely tough, but I think we always had this thing in our mind that it's not forever. Like it's going to be for a year or so. So I think that brought us a lot of comfort is that we're not leaving South Africa. Mm. We're just going to go abroad to do our thing and then yeah. we're going to come back. So um, he's very passionate about South Africa and making it a better place and working in the community and helping people. And that's has forever been his passion and it's even as he grow older and even when he was away that passion even grew more and more so he's very passionate about the community and 
yeah, just serving people and making it better for people. Um, so, yeah, he always says he's part of the ground. So he's deal van die grond. So yeah. there, was, there was definitely times where it was very tough for him being abroad. It was tougher for him than it was for me. Um, and I was trying to make sense out of it, but it was because he's so part of this country and so passionate about South Africa that um, I kind of, that brought a bit, bit more perspective for me or understanding for why he feels the way he does. But yeah, so we're back now and he's very happy in his own <laughs> habitat. Enjoying it over here in the time, yes. yeah. Mm. Um, his, is his family from Bloemfontein? Or yeah, so he grew up here. Um, his family, everybody's, most of his family is in Bloemfontein. So there's a lot of Petorius here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I know that, like, especially in the free state, when you go to these smaller towns, you'd find like one family dominates the entire mm. town. Like if you go to Fuchsburg area, <laughs> yeah. all of them, I think, I think they're actually Pretorius in, in is Fuchsburg. It? Well, Pretorius like, everywhere, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, you can't keep yeah. you guys, can't keep you yeah. guys down, it But seems. yeah, so he's also very like into history and knows a lot about history. So that's one of the reason why we, so any free time we have, we go and visit small towns. Um, just the, 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 the beauty of that small town, the stories it tells and the things you um, discover when you're there, the people you meet. So um, that's one. When people ask us what is our hobbies or what do we do in our free time, that's the first thing we say is take the car and go to a, any small town because there's always great stories and things you can learn there yeah. and great people you meet. No, it's, it's really cool when you can dig into your heritage in such a way that, mm. as you say, now, like he's, he's, he's a proud South African but he's also proudly Afrikaans and he, he likes yep. digging into that heritage and like reconnecting with that yes he's a always proud good. Afrikaner and yeah. not like South Afrikaner like he it's not just for the the African culture or this Afrikaner culture but also any culture like yeah. he's very passionate about being diverse finding a way to work together and um, yeah enriching not just one culture, but the the beauty and being away from South Africa, the beauty of our country is the fact that we have we are so diverse. That's the one thing we really missed when we went to South Africa to ask, to ask was the diversity, different people, different cultures, different languages. That's the thing we missed the most about South Africa. And but yes, that's one of the things that he really is passionate about, making it better for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I. I, I went overseas for a little bit, obviously not as, as long as you guys go over. But when I got back, I was entering a, like a security complex somewhere. And the security guard, they, we were there for a, a housewarming. And obviously you go in and you're like, do you know where this place is? And I mean, when there's 20 cars going into this, asking for the same address, they know there's a little like something gathering, going, something yeah. going on there. And the way that he just like sort of jokes and guys with you and like, are you guys going to pull our hard and what, what mm. it's, I think it's something that you don't find like all over the world, to be honest, that sort of, you, you meet a guy in the, in the shopping mall and mm. you start chatting and then there's immediately that, that sort of connection. But that's the beauty of our country is the fact that we are not all the same. We are different. Yeah. And uh, that's definitely something we should even invest or even invest even more in. Yeah. Um, but that's the, yeah, that is the beauty of our country and the reason why, it, I feel like it does bring a lot more, like it brings the bad, but also the good. Yeah. We just need to keep on investing in the good and um, strive for that. I mean, that, that's part of the reason why I started this, this podcast as well, is I feel we give, we give a lot of airtime to the bad in South Africa. Mm. Like we, we give those guys a lot of, um, voice and we you hear about them a lot and i feel like it, it might be worth having just i mean even if it's just me and bluefontaine trying a little something to get the the good out there as well to mm. to, to show um other south africans uh, as well as the rest of the world like this is a, this is an awesome country i mean definitely and like everybody's experience is different and people experience it differently and they feel the way they feel and they can feel the way they feel they're allowed to do or feel that way yeah. um, but it's also you always just going to hear the negative 
the whole time. You're not going to hear the positive. And it's going to take a bit more effort from yourself to actually go and dig in deeper and find the positive. It's not yeah. the negative is going to come, but you have to go and find the positive. And it's also like how you, what you give is what you're going to get. Yeah. So you have you have to be that person, and just in terms of positive, negative, you have you'll have to go and look for it. Yes, and and I mean it's I think it's very much a mindset thing as well. So if you're going into this, uh, if if you it's it's that thing of they say. Um, have you noticed how many red cars there are recently? And now when you leave here, you're like, yo, there are red cars everywhere. Or when you want to mm. buy a certain car. Um, it's the same thing with, with good news and positivity. Like, if, if you surround yourself with people who complain the whole time, and that's, that is going to be your default Definitely. setting. And it's going to be very difficult for you to get out of that. And when you look around, you're going to just become more negative and you're going to become one of those voices. Yeah, and you always have a choice. So you can decide what you want to take in. Um, it, the choice is still yours. Yeah. What you're going to allow in and what you're going to take and make your own. On on, on the previous podcast, Vir and I actually discussed the fact that when, when you're talking like this and someone listens, they're actually giving your brain, their brain to you for a while. And then you hand it back at the a, at a end of a, of a podcast session and you want people to grow or learn mm. or feel better about themselves. So, I mean, as you just said, hopefully whatever you take in, what what you consume in the end um, becomes who you are. Definitely. Mm. Uh, sp- speaking of what you consume becoming who you are, I, I mean, I know you've got your master's in uh, dietetics as well. Yeah, that word it gets <laughs> me every time. Um, would you say like that was an advantage with obviously being in the sports environment do you manage your own um, diet and nutrition or do you still have someone are you scared of like becoming a bit single uh it definitely like people often ask me are you on a diet i'm like no i have this this is my lifestyle and you kind of just want to you try and make the healthier option but it's so part of you it's so part of who i am because you grew up you grow up and you learn and you kind of it's part of it's that it's in it's your habit so it was in it was in your um like growing up already yeah so you always make sure you kind of have that balanced diet um and so it was never like i'm gonna change this and i have to take this out it's like you kind of always try to make the right decisions but being in a high performance environment with the sunshine coast lightning um i've realized how important every aspect is it's not just training on court, training your skill, but the off court strength wise, um, conditioning wise, nutrition wise, uh, mental well being, um, your overall well being, um, looking after your body, um, being happy off court, like all of that plays a role um, or into the athlete as a as a whole your unit. performance on court. The, and I'm I can really say it like if you're happy on court it's gonna reflect on court. And for me it's that whole holistic approach, not just that physical preparation and nutrition, but also that mental well being and making sure I have a purpose and um so when I went over to um Australia, that's when I started my or I started with my masters. Yeah. And that was very important, um so part of that journey because you don't just want to be in that netball environment. You have to have something that can stimulate your brain. Um, yes, just something else other than netball. So I almost f- um, feel this was more, of, there was a bigger purpose in that, not just for that masters or that research, but that it was um, part of that holistic approach, just yeah. keeping my brain active. And, and then people often ask me, but why do you continue studying the whole time? Um, because I enjoy it and I feel like it's really keeping my, or, um, just keeping my brain active and yeah. filling that part of my life. So, so, I mean, I, I sort of watched the TED talk last week on the opposite of this, where you have people who are CEOs of massive companies and you'd often find a lot of them have this sort of side project or side thing that they do. So you'd, you'd find, um, I remember one of the guys was a... Um, like concert I think violinist basically mm. and then he, he travels with his like group and he plays like world stage violin and the, the, the premise of the TED talk they called it serious leisure is the fact that if, if you are a high-ranking CEO and that's your only identity 
the minute that comes into um, question, the minute someone challenges you or the company's struggling a bit, mm. you start spinning because you don't know who you are anymore. And I think it, it might, with, with professional sport players, it might be the reverse kind of thing. Like you, you this professional sport player, but now you lose three games in a row. If you don't have something that you, mm. I'm not only a netballer, I'm this whole person. So yes. even if the net, even if netball got deleted off the face of the earth today, I'm still a, a whole human. And that's a that's a, one of the things. Or people invest so much in it, and that's why I always tell people at university level: like invest in your social life, invest in your academics, invest in your netball. It there shouldn't be one that gets more attention than yeah. the others. Because being balanced will reflect in all those areas. And um, for me, that was one. Because when you look at professional athletes, you train in the morning. Say, for instance, from 5 to 9 and then later today. So then you have the whole day of not doing anything. And you can't just... It makes you... You have to have something else. You can invest your time in. Or I'm going to go home, um, get ready for the day, and I'm going to sit and work on my computer or do a bit of research. You have to you have to have, or I have to have yeah. that something else that can keep me going that day. And then also I can switch off and go to training. So I don't have to think about training or performing the whole time. The whole time. It's that whole holistic approach. But also everything that I'm doing is with purpose. So I'm not, I'm not just doing them. Ma- oh, I didn't just do the masters to do the masters. So I've, I've learned a lot out of it. Yeah. Um, but also like sport management, it's something that I enjoy doing. So all of this is like investing for life after netball as well. Yeah. Because my biggest fear sense. or learning from other sports people, like when they their career is done as a sport person, a lot of them go into depression. They don't have a purpose afterwards mm. and I don't want to be that person. And I believe, I truly believe that my journey as a netballer this is the, the like the pre <laughs> of what, what, what is a, what coming. What a beginning for what's coming there. You set yourself up for it. Yeah, so I've learned so much life. during my journey, but I, I I feel like it's preparing me for something. Sorry, for something bigger than just the sport. Exactly, I and mean, I am excited for what's coming after this. And what it is, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But I know I enjoy working with people. I enjoy working in the community and. Um, like giving people the tools to look after themselves, um, running programs where they can have a better life. Um, so I know that, but what's going to come after, I'm not sure, but I'm excited. You know, it's going to be good. It. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know, definitely. So, um, do, do you, from that perspective, have, because I mean, it, it sounds like you think things through a lot. Do you have some sort of mentor or someone who, um, guided you at some point or now even or someone you talk to or Mm, well I can't really say somebody specific but there's a lot of people that cross my path that really enabled me or um, embedded that confidence and that willingness to to dream and to strive and be ambitious Um, so yeah there's a lot of people um, I can't just say one, but yeah. Im- immediate people would definitely be my parents and then Werner as well. Yeah. Just in the way that he's living and how he's passionate about his, what he's doing. And you kind of just want to be, go with him and be as successful or do it together. So it's like he's taking the lead and you kind of, you just want to follow. Yeah. I mean, I-, I believe people who love their passion to such a degree they're basically, you know, when you're in a pool and you like run around in the pool and you make that whole little, like, um, little wave pool thingy. Um, it, it's that sort of thing. Like when you see someone living and chasing their passions with such like ferocity and without fear, you can't help but having some of that lights up in you as well and mm-hmm. being um, like dragged along in their wake, basically. Just, uh, and, and I do think, well. From what I hear, both of you are, are, are people like that. But if you like, it's coming back to that looking for that positive new. There's such, there's so many good initiatives and um, people like in small towns running um, programs where they just um, really empower their community. And 
it looks so easy to do it. You just need somebody to do it. So um, that is something that's really inspiring and like kind of motivates you to just make that immediate difference um, in your community. And yeah. I think it's so easy to do it. You just need to do it. You just need to st stick your hand up and start exactly, doing it. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And do you think that sort of, um, for, for Nepal specifically now, do you think that sort of community-driven approach um, drives a bright future for Nepal South Africa? Do you think it's, it's driven enough or do you think more can be done? No, to? definitely. More can definitely be done. Oh. Um, there's a lot of, um, and I don't know what the exact... Um, like wasted potential. Yes, but the, there's not a lot of, they're not giving up, been given, people are not giving opportunities to actually play. And through the sport, you have so much power to empower people, yeah. to make a difference in their life within the community. Uh, but there's not programs being run to enable. And it's something simple. You train once a week or you play, at, uh, you start a league in Bluefortain and people get the opportunity to play it's as simple as that. It's just getting it, um, getting it up and get, running. Getting it up and running. So I feel like through the sport, there's a lot of opportunity to empower, especially young girls. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely netball as the vehicle can give that opportunity to empower, especially young Bunch girls. Of young yeah. Girls. Yeah. And I mean. Um, if you you were obviously at some point a young girl yourself and then you had these these dreams probably of of playing for the PTS mm -hmm. one day um was was it always because i know oftentimes sports people they're athletic right and so you sort of have you playing netball but you also have a finger in a few different pies like you not sure whether you want to do the netball or some athletics or something on the side was it always netball for you or was there some other well uh, my mom and dad always encouraged us to do as many as many sport as we can. So we did everything. We played tennis, athletics, softball. We played cricket. Yeah, all over we the played place. netball. Um, we played golf. So we did everything, and they yeah. gave us that opportunity. So they would drive us around to go for extra lessons or go to tennis lessons. So, but then eventually, towards the end, um, netball was kind of the one that stood out. And I think it's because of the whole team sport environment and working as a team. Mm. Um, and it was just something I really enjoyed doing and um, I was willing to work even harder for. But at, from a young age, I always imagined going overseas and going to play in a abroad I'm going to play it. So it sounds like a cliche, but I had that dream. Yeah. And I feel like it created that um, that world to really work hard. Um, and the opportunities came along. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, I always say that there's really no replacement for hard work. And I feel like the combination of good skill and hard work really came together for me. Um, and the opportunity came along. And I went overseas. And even in that time where me and Werner just um, got in together and that opportunity came along, he was like, well, it's always been your dream. You have to go. Yeah. Where a lot of girls would then decide maybe it's not. For me. But the fact that he's, he always supported me and allowed me to do what I uh, wanting to do. But it's all also in within yourself to put down your foot and say, well, this has always been my dream and be true to yourself and follow it. And it's going to work out exactly the way it, Should. or I think it, it worked out it's, the way it should. It's busy working yes. out exactly the way mm. it should. And I mean, as you say now, it's, it's very important, important like someone, someone like him who allows you to chase, to chase those dreams. Because, uh, again, like, it, as you said now, it's very easy to, like, no, I, I rather want to, want to, like, stick to the, this close living mm -hmm. or this sort of small, small dreams, rather. And I think someone like that really enables you to, like, those dreams aren't, like, as impossible as you thought. Like, you can easily, you can easily do that and so much more. And definitely a lot of my success is because I had the support of him. Yeah. Um, and he really makes me a better person, even a better player. Like, try makes it easy for me, keeps me happy, and it really reflects on court. The year yeah. I won Player of the Year, um, we were together in Australia, and 
I feel like that played a big part. We were together, we were on this adventure and we got to experience a lot of things. So we were so happy off court and it definitely reflected on court as well. So a lot of that I give credit to him. It is just that whole holistic and having him there to support, to support me mm. that really played a big part. Um, but what I wanted to say as well is that a lot of this, so I, I told you like I had this dream and I had to go, but also I tend to not, people always often ask what is the, there should be like a, a story, like you broke your knee and you came back from an injury. But there wasn't, <laughs> like there should always be something bad yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a, a down happening in the and dumps. you came back even stronger. But I've never been, there's never been that really in my journey. It kind of, it didn't always go f um, smooth sailing. But the thing that I had to do is m make a lot of sacrifices. And yeah. But I choose to talk about the good, the everything worked out the way it should because all of that is so part of the journey and people that would say well you're not going to make it um and then obviously all the things you have to leave behind but also in terms of like being a dietitian but you're losing out on that actual um working in the field so i you sacrifice a lot of things to do what you can yeah, or yeah. do what you do but what i'm trying to say is that if it's worth it, it's not always going to be an easy decision to make. Yeah, yeah. But you'll have to make the sacrifices to eventually live your dream. I, I think they always say you can you can overcome any how if you have the correct why. Mm. So if, if you've got the correct motivation for why, why you're doing something, those it makes it a bit easier. Like when, when you're down in the dumps a bit and you need to go for a run now. It makes it run a bit easier, or it makes, it makes every step that you take along the journey a bit easier. And that, easier. I see, is part of the journey. If it wasn't for that, then I wouldn't have been where I am today. So it makes you stronger. Um, it, it's part of the journey, and it's part of the good journey. Mm. But was, was there ever, along this journey, a, a time, I mean, there's no, you said now there's no dramatic, like, uh, big events that happened, but... Surely there were times where motivation, or you, you feel a bit uncertain, like, well, will this actually work out? Or did, did you never have those sort of doubts? Well, now, just as I said, like, the sacrifices of not being together, living on different continents, being away from family, friends, missing out on big events, mm. like weddings, family events. So that was kind of, and then it's not just one or two, it's like constant things. So you, you're you missing out on that relationships and then just being away from Werner. Um, it wasn't always easy. Like we were apart, we made it work, but there was definitely difficult times and mm -hmm. getting through it. But luckily we we found a way. And maybe it's because we knew there's a bigger, or what the bigger picture is and um, that, it's something you've worked for your whole life. Yeah. So, so I guess you two, um, very early in your relationship, you already communicated that sort of, because I mean, it's it's a, it's a he, he must have known what he was getting into. It's a tough it's a tough thing to drop on someone like. Yeah, I think I'm probably going to go overseas and play netball for a career or or that I, sort of thing. I, I always wonder if it's maybe it had to work out the way it did. With him living. Forward. Obviously, I didn't tell him like I'm gonna. <laughs> One day I'm gonna play overseas. <laughs> so I was when that opportunity came along. Then it's we started that conversation. So it wasn't really um, something we spoke about beforehand. It we kind of as it came, we without it and um, got through it. Um, I, yeah, I think so. I think that happens often where we try to um, like we 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 worry so much about things that never pop up. Like you you try and solve all of these things that's in your head. Well, it's it's actually just better to take it like as as, it as they come, mm. solve one issue as it as it pops up. Like live live your day, and however tough it may be today, then tomorrow you you just you do, yeah. you do it again and again and again. Well, I believe that everything happens for a reason, and your journey is your journey. So whether it's a good thing coming or a bad thing, it's part of the journey. You'll just have to get through it. Yeah. And you're gonna learn from it, and it's gonna make you big. Uh, gonna make you better, 
and possibly for a reason for whatever whatever is after yeah pre- preparing you for for what's mm. to come and then i i think even if like it's it's very easy i was so thankful when when we spoke on the phone and you're like you think it'll be nice to give people some perspective because i mean that's that's i think a, a big thing that's that's missing nowadays from people um you you get that first little bit of resistance or people telling you no it's not possible or um something small happens that sort of mm. nudges or budges your dreams and then you give up like i think it's very easy while if you if you've got perspective and you're like this thing that happened to me it it sucks like it's really not ideal especially in that moment <laughs> yeah, yeah. but then as it gone past you can put it a bit more in perspective and you go like, oh okay that's why it happened or that's why it should have happened yeah i think that that's why i want to talk to so so many different people because then you you get all of these sort of stories and then someone who's currently within that moment mm. who might be thinking like someone chasing their dreams now as a young netballster and everyone might not be in a corner well everyone's never in your corner but she might be hearing a lot of negative voices and she I, I think it can really help a lot if someone listens to someone someone like you. I mean, just me interacting with you now, I can tell like you're genuinely someone who believes in what you're doing or whatever you mm-hmm. chase. Yeah, a lot of, and I believe one person's journey is not the same. Every every person have a different journey. So, mm-hmm. what I went through, it's going to be different for somebody else. But you can definitely learn out of people's journey and how they dealt with it and. Um, how they got through it. Um, so, like today, somebody asked me about, like, she's at university and she's really struggling with juggling netball and her studies and how should she do it. Um, and the thing is, I can't tell, it's it's not going to, it's my, I got through it, so it's definitely something, and, and I, I think that's the reason why she asked me is because yeah. she knew what I went through Um or what during study so like studying dietetics and playing netball going on tours and missing out on tests and then had to do it um, mondelings um and then missing and then had to do catch up but i got through it and it once again requires a bit of sacrifices um like maybe when your mate asks you like you let's go for a drink or you'll have to say no because i have to spend that hour investing in my studies yeah um, so it's that fine line of realizing what is important for you, where you want to invest your your time at that stage to make it work. But I feel like you don't have to sacrifice. You don't have to give up Everything. one or the other. It's good to have both. It's just finding a way to balance all of that. But what I want to say is that it's not going to be the same for one person and a, other, and a different person. But okay, I think I went off the topic of it but <laughs> there's no topic so we can um, go wherever you want the thing or what i actually wanted to say was a lot of people ask me and it's prob- probably a sensitive topic um within our sport is that whole quitter style so yeah and a lot of young girls come and ask me but i know why somebody else is taking my spot while i knew i should have gotten that spot but i was then i would always tell them well find a way if if you're only going to be, if there's only four of you in that team, then you be the best of oh, that four. Cool. Don't let that um, um, demotivate you. You then be the best of that four. Yeah, the, let, let, instead you of, find instead a of way, that bringing you down, let it, yes, let let it, it motivate you, up, you. Let it motivate let it, you to chase it even harder. Yes, because that's obviously also part of the journey. And um, it also happens for a reason, but then be the best of that four. Yeah. If that's the scenario or the situation, then, but then there as well, your the parents play a big role because they would often, yeah, make the kids negative and yes. But one thing that I'm very grateful for, my dad always told me that if you want to be the best, you got to train like the best. And um, if I didn't make teams, then he would just say, then you have to work harder. If you want to be the best, you have to work harder. You'll have to show them. And that was always his advice to me. And I feel like that brought me very far. Yeah. And it's kind of a thing that I'm always telling people is that if you're only four, if there's only spot for four, you be the best of that four. Yeah. It's as simple as that. 
I also think I mean it sounds like your dad did a good job but I think that's a tough balancing act as well when you mm. when you're with your kids in in sport and they're young now they they excel at something so they I mean obviously you are very very good but now you get kids who are they're good but they're like school good you know like they're, they're the best tennis player in their school and I think sometimes then the parents sort of lose focus of what mm. what the idea of, of the sport is I mean you you do want someone to um, reach their max capacity but I also think it's a fine line to make sure that you don't like push them just over the edge and, and, yeah. and then they lose I mean all the only reason why you could have come as far as you did was because of your passion for netball and that could have easily and been smothered you, if it's you are doing it if you and it's an anything you do if you enjoy doing it you're going to invest time in it you're going to work hard you would want to make a success out of it and success meaning not necessarily being successful but enjoying yeah and it wakes you or it's worth getting up in the morning and going to work or do it every day but just to add on um like when i was at school i never made the provincial team so i was never oh, really so i was kind of floating yeah so i was there I, I always knew i was good but i i enjoyed what i'm doing and uh, once again just kept on working hard never made the teams and in that stage that's when my dad would say well you just have to Keep David die die it was always his saying <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, but then just being work hard and so that they have to pick you or have to put you in the team so where he could have gone other way and say oh the system this the system that and it's the end of this and well and there was probably times where they were also a bit negative, but then they would come back and just say, well, we'll just have to be Let's better. Take a new approach and to this or try this definitely. and try that. Um, so do you, have you ever, fr from that whole holistic approach, have you ever played against a player where you can kind of, t I don't know whether this is possible, to, but where you can kind of tell this person is... Um, physically like superior to me but you just decide i'm gonna keep like hounding them and then you realize mentally you can uh, not break them down but you know like tire them out like you know mentally you're stronger than them so no matter if, th if they can jump higher than you can you're gonna jump more than they can that, that sort of thing i think the biggest thing and that's the beauty of the sunk of super Nepal, that's the league in australia is yeah. that you get the opportunity to train with the best but also play against the best mm. so everywhere i feel like in south africa it's very really one dynamic one dimensional so you'll play this so your opponent would always be this one kind of style where in australia every game you play is a different style so you kind of have to prepare and adapt because every goal attack which is the position i usually play against yeah. um is they're all different so you'll have to do the work beforehand but for me it's always been focusing on my strength what is my bread and butter what is the things that makes me good and um knowing that if i do the hard work during the week like train hard um going with a purpose into training doing my strength nutrition but also um analyzing my opponent yeah um plays a big role knowing how they play their style if i did all of that during the week there's nothing i could do that is in my control what happens in the game is out of my control but the fact that i know i did the preparation kind of yes makes me um, give me the opportunity just to play because i knew i did all the work i can and i'm prepared mentally physically and i can just go out and play but it's always for me it's always been and I acknowledge the players I play against that's really putting me under pressure and making my work hard, but it's always motivating, motivating me to kind of work a bit harder and this time around, let's see if I can stop her or um, yeah, yeah. so. But the main thing for me is focusing on my game, my strength, what I'm good at, my bread and butter, my go-to stuff. And I know if I execute that, it, it will definitely well. bring the yeah. um, results. You've done it enough times to know that it's a, it's a proven recipe. Yes. So you control what you can control. What happens in the game is... But it's it's also that, like... And, and that's one thing you learn during a game. Like, you can be quiet for three quarters, and then it's doing that work, 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 and then that last quarter, 
you get the intercepts or the turnovers and the gain. So it's kind of there was one year where they all knew the last quarter is when I'm going to come through. But it's doing that hard work and um, tiring them out and then the balls or the intercepts or the turnovers gains is going to come that last quarter. So it's just trusting in your your ability, um, trusting in my ability and what I'm good at and know that I've done the work so I can just go out and... Keep doing it doing over it, and over yes. again. That, that's always something I find I find funny about people is like, you know, those like last second goals. It's as if people value those more than the goals that were scored during the first ten minutes of like, like you know those. Definitely, it's, it's like people want to start hustling in that last ten minutes while they forget like, had I just maintained this throughout in the first like as you said now the first three quarters or whatever, if I just did my part then. I wouldn't have been under the pressure that I mm. that I am now necessarily. But that's the beauty of our game. It's like so unpredictable and it can change. You can be 10, 20 goals in front and it can change in one quarter. So it's yeah. like you you have to go from beginning to end. So is there so describing that do you think there's some sort of uh, do you think it's a it's just like a positivity thing like like a team builds up momentum and then they realize or do you think it's just like they realize there's holes over here or it's one team being fitter than another or it's that just coming together? trusting your process and yeah. the things your game plan and it's executing that doing the process and it's all going to come together and hopefully to bring the, the results. results yeah um but that's one thing about the australian league as well like you and that's one reason why we did so well as a um as a sport patria team during the world cup is we all play so a lot of south africa play go abroad to play in england league new zealand and australia league so okay. we gain a lot of experience and you train with the best trying to or you play against the best you train with the best and you get that experience so you know how to deal with those different situations mm-hmm. and the reason why we did so well is that we all had that experience so we knew how it feels to play against the top teams in the world yeah um and you you come up against these goal attack week in week out so you know their style um you're confident in your ability and coming up against them where previous years we've never played australia and new zealand so when we come up against they are already like these Superhumans. Superhumans. <laughs> yeah. But the fact that we, over the years, started playing them more, competing against them, we gained that experience and know how it feels and um, in tough situations. But like with the Sanko Super League, every game is close. So it's never, it's always, a co- it's not like, oh, this weekend it's going to be an easy game. It's like you have to be on top of your game every week. Yeah. And that's the reason why it's the top league in the world. And all the top players plays there, but also the reason why us as a South African possibly are doing so well is the fact that we play in these different leagues. So we're oh, we're four players playing in the Australian league. Okay. Yes. I, I actually so obviously getting into this, I gave the the things a bit of a Google and whatnot, <laughs> and I saw quite ironically one of the girls. I think her surname is Longman. Langman. Oh, yeah, yes. oh, Langman. I was like, well, that, she was born to play netball. Like yes. that's, that, that, that's, a, that's a clear sign. Like you. Yeah. You so she's like netball. the goat. So greatest of all time. Oh, is it? She's yes. very good. So she's from New Zealand. Yeah. So you get New Zealand players playing in the Australian League, England, Jamaica, South Africa. Um, so the top players go to Australia to play in that league. So Langman, which is she was she retired now. She was our captain. Um, at Sunshine Coast Lightning Um, and she was the captain of the Ferns and and they also won the World Cup Um, but yeah she's she's pretty good (laughs) very very good at the game (laughs) yeah no no I I just thought I was like this is it's it's one of those cases where someone uh, they always show examples of people with having surnames that's like uh, appropriate for the jobs that they (laughs) that they should be doing but the ironic is she's not very tall oh is it she's (laughs) She's not not very tall tall at all (laughs) yes that is that is quite ironic. Um, tell me, going going into a game, you spoke about the effort that you put on um, off field or before you get on court. Um, do you have any like go to routine, like something a bit odd, like some, you know, like not not necessarily something super superstitious, but just like something you do to get yourself in the right state of mind for well just before we go into court, I quickly have to run to the loo. Yeah. So that's the like I have to go. Just, every, every single game yeah so that's then I'm thing. ready to go yeah yeah um, but there's not really specifically anything that I do 
but like I, I like the feeling of feeling full. So like one thing I'm eating is like a rice cake with peanut butter well, and that's, that's honey. My, so that's just to have weakness. something. So I'll kind of like, and it's probably a bit of a combination between nerves and just being busy before a game is then I'll have that snack and also have a coffee. But it's just that fine line of not overdoing it because you don't want to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> but done. by the by now, like over the years, you've kind of worked out what works for you. Um, so it's just kind of having something to eat, to drink, while everybody's getting ready in the change room, strapping, doing their prehab, and then yes. Yeah. So, so, so just nothing specific. Out what, works for, what works for you for you on your own? Do Do you think that's a that's a good approach to um, like dieting in general? Do you think? every person needs to figure out what works for them or do you think there's uh, there are some truth that hold across the board and then you need to tweak it for you or what what would your yeah so everybody so some people w don't want to eat two hours like they want to eat three hours before and not eat again where i'll right. have a main meal three hours before and then just have a bit of a snack before a game where some people don't have anything at all because okay. they don't want to have that feeling or so every individual is different so the main approach is like figuring out what works for you so that's why we have so we'll do it before trainings or training matches so then the dietitian would work out, okay, let's try this. Oh, this didn't work during training or didn't work during the training match. So we try and work it out before a competition yeah. or before the league starts. So you kind of have your, um, your uh, routine of what nutritional, um, what your nutritional needs is and um, what you need to do before a game. So, um, yeah, we have a great dietitian working with us um, and then – you do all of that. You train that basically, and yeah, then it's, figure it's out. It's part of that work that you talk about, the off-court mm. work. It's but every individual is different, so yeah. that's and why it's so individualized. And I mean, not it's not a big group thing. So every individual have their has plan their and, and, and the, that, strategy. That's the, basically, that's the trick of the dietitian, I suppose, is to tailor to mm. to all of the needs of these people. Definitely. But but do you think that uh, not talking about? Uh, professional sports people now specifically but do you think that is uh, the the general case as well in terms of suppose you had to put me on on a diet now would you would you say that people need to each take their own approach do you are you someone who believes in um like the the sort of listen to your body approach or a more like hard science like measure everything on an app approach or is it something in between no it's definitely individual based so it's going to be like getting to know you, what your um, diet history is and yeah. what your routine is because you'll specifically have things you are kind of invested in but then you find a way to do it. So it's still like it's not going to put you completely off what you're doing. It's yeah. just helping you to kind of be a bit better or a bit healthier. So it's investigating that and see where you're at. Are you meeting your needs? Are you making sure you um, have a balanced diet? Um, so yeah, it's very individual based, definitely. Mm. So, and and you, just on the thing was like body versus like tracking everything and noting everything down. There's um, definitely. Do you think it differs from person to person as well? There's definitely that definitely helps to make a more accurate or help with the interve in investigation and tracking exactly where what you do. So. So, say for instance, there was one stage where we literally tracked everything we did. We had this thing around our arm to measure our, um, like, um, everything we do, our activity, um, and then we'll log out of all our food. So, it's just helping for a more accurate... Yeah. Um, I mean... You what you're doing. So, there's definitely... But it's very... People don't often... It's very under-measured because people now so all of a sudden try and eat the right thing. And then, so you try and keep it as normal as possible because then you can make a more accurate, um, see if you um, do, your intake is enough or it's not enough. And in terms of physical activity, do you meet all those needs? So Yeah. We, we also, I mean, I work for a, a wellness company and we try to, or we know that if you just tell someone something is measured, 
it already improves like yes. w- without having to suggest any intervention whatsoever just because you know like someone someone's watching what i do now you, you make some small changes so that's why it's difficult i suppose to measure these things objectively but that's a, you just have to be in that mindset that it's not to try and like give you some uh, trouble now it's to get help you, you. Trouble. yeah exactly it's to help you so it's just getting people to understand that yeah from that perspective but yeah, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm very thankful for the chat and I think that I've um, learned a lot and we've, we've covered some wide topics here. Um, but I, I think hopefully it, it does help someone who um, needs that bit of perspective or needs that bit of motivation, that little bit of positivity that you spoke mm-hmm. about to pick that up and carry on with their, with their journeys. Yeah, there's always a way. You just have to find it. And some people's way is probably is going to be easier than somebody else's way. But it's just pushing through, getting away. And um, I, I have no doubt that at the end it will definitely be worth it. So it's just um, knowing yourself, backing yourself, mm-hmm. and then just finding a way, whether it's through hard work or through um just pushing through it so yeah just that great thanks a lot carla right thank you honey was like a conversation um yeah so we were actually just on our way out and then we started chatting again we we're like maybe we should <laughs> let's add come in, back. Yo, let's go back let's let's record another few minutes and um talk because what you just said well actually you can just talk to what you what you just mentioned your yeah i think one of the or it's something that recently came up was a lot of well being in bloemfontein a lot of people ask me where can they go and play and if they're not part of a university we obviously know in south africa if you're part of a university that's where you are most likely to experience a high performance in, um, environment and that's the environment that gives you the opportunity to play a lot of netball. Mm-hmm. So if you're not in an environment or if you're not in a university um, structure, the chances for you to play netball in a league is is decreasing significantly. Mm-hmm. So um, I think there's a really a big need for like just social competition, social league within the different... Um, different cities and if I'm specifically referring to Bluefontein there's a lot of people asking me like where can they go and play is there a club in the city where they can go can go and play and we know back in the old days there was a lot of like police ramblers yeah all all guys there was a lot of opportunity for people who wasn't part of a university to actually play netball and nowadays they kind of if you want to play you go play action netball so that's a bit of opportunity to do that but not all people like all the ladies or people like um, the action sport. So I feel like there's a big opportunity to actually have a league within Bloemfontein, like a social league. So um, just, just what's the difference between the action netball and the normal netball? So sport? action netball is like indoors and it has a yeah. net around the around the court. So the ball is never out. Yeah. Okay. So it's a bit different to normal netball like where outside is the normal netball. So, um, yeah, I think that's one of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently is that would be a good opportunity for people to play. And that idea slowly but surely really um, grown inside of me. And I feel like I want to make it my mission to actually start a few. There is clubs, established club, but actually some of those clubs having their own netball team and... Um, we're starting a a league in the city, so and that will provide a playing opportunity for a lot of individuals, like whether they just want to do it socially, yeah, or if some of um, talent that we miss just because they're not in a university, exactly. but then give opportunity to identify talent um, um, within the the non university structures or um, environment. And I mean, I think. Uh, this is going to sound like I'm just uh, trying to kiss your ass now, but that's not the case. But I do think <laughs> someone like you endorsing and backing these sort of leagues lends a lot of credibility to them. So someone who's looking for young talent might not go to a city league just casually, but if, if they know that you sort of um, support and you're involved in this in the city league, I think it'll give a lot of 
a lot more credibility to, to that sort of thing. Yes, definitely. And um, knowing that the Nepal World Cup 2023 is happening in South Africa, oh, is it? Um, in Cape Town. Um, so it's within the next few years. And we always say, like, it's not just how the Pratia, the sport Pratia perform at that tournament, but it's the things outside of it. What can we, what can be a sustainable thing we can create um, or the World Cup can drive for us after the World Cup? I would like to see um, sustainable developing happening, um, established league within the different cities, more opportunity for people to play, um, actual courts being built, um, and programs being run, run, run there. Yeah. So it's it's so much bigger than just the World Cup and the sport players performing there and hopefully get a, a podium finish. It's the things outside of it. What can we? I feel like that's very um, like a short term goal, but we need something that's sustainable afterwards. Yeah. So currently, you burn bright every every World Cup. You peak and you like for for but that period. Should... You work hard, but there's nothing that carries you through. Uh, yeah. In terms of development, we can do a lot more op- playing opportunity. We can do a lot more. So I like to see those things being established in the yeah. build up for World Cup. So when World Cup is finished, and I'm sure we'll host a successful one um, with. Um, it being a Cape Town and all the different, how different it is in South Africa, that yeah. whole cultural experience. I've no doubt that that would be something different compared to all the other World Cups we've experienced before. But for me, is that sustainable thing afterwards? Like not just that World Cup uh, programs being ran after that. Yeah, I, I can imagine if it's something that you're that passionate about, you don't want to see it like just be this bright event and then after that it's like kind of moved back like forgotten to some extent like you, you wanted to carry through mm. um but I, I think i don't even know about it being in south africa i mean that's that's awesome news and i i think part part of that is i mean we're supposed to know this i feel um the, the awareness Definitely. that should be created because i mean i try to stay on top of things and activities to do if you can tell people listen I mean, it's going to be the it's going to be the end of COVID, so people are going to be keen for whatever mm. is going on. So if you tell people, listen, there's netball World Cup in South Africa, you can have so many people who just like suck eight there for the for the years of it. Yes, and I remember one of my funnest and most memorable games and stadiums I played in was in January 2018 when we had the quad series in Johannesburg. Yeah. So it was at Alice Park. And that stadium was packed and the people were singing and dancing and there was this Vuvuzelas being blown. And it was it was on a whole different level. And I know that the World Cup is going to be exactly like that. And that's the thing that stood out for all the other players coming from abroad is that there's so much hears and it's so entertaining. They almost stop playing to watch, to watch the people. crowd. <laughs> but that's the thing, like overseas, they'll pack the stadium, but it was it will be very like sit and watch and a bit of shouting, but it's in a whole different level yeah. in South Africa. So that itself will definitely be magnificent come 2023. But going back to your initial question is, I can go on for days about women in sport. I feel like that it's very unequal um, and we train just as hard we sacrifice even more but we're not on we're not where we we're on a good level but we don't get the recognition or the exposure or um, the support we deserve and it's a it's not just a problem in our country it's worldwide like even going to Australia um, like realizing how far behind the world is in terms of bringing women and male sport, female and female. male sport together or on the same level. It's just um, even in a first world country and it being a professional sport there, they're still so, so far behind compared to male sport. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of reason for it, but um, it's just simple things that like media wise. So one thing that was really um, annoying me when I was in Australia is that when, and I'm not picking on anyone, but when they were always right about rugby players playing in the English league or 
the French League game against Thunderbirds, which on court, there was three, four South Africans on the court. You would read nothing in the newspapers. Nothing, so yeah. just something simple like that, you'll never read about. And every now and then you read about female sport, but it won't be a consistent thing. And you'll find a lot of stories to write about if you just go and actually write mm. about female sport. I mean, we're in the we're competing against the, playing in the best league, playing against the best. Um, four of the twelve, four of the fourteen players on court is South African. Yeah, we're all crazy. starting lineup, playing against each other, but you read nothing of it. Yeah. So mainly. Like even like you not knowing the Netball World Cup is coming up, it's it's going back to that media media exposure, and I feel like media can do a lot more in writing about women in sport, um, and giving that um, recognition it deserves. So I just want to give credit to one platform that actually does it is G Sport, which every week they'll write about women in sport, women in sport. But we need more platforms or um, um. Platforms like that to actually write about it can't just be them all the time, but they're doing a great job. But we need our network feeding yeah, like the, the classic news providers to, to also actually get on board. write about it. Um, and there's a whole lot of good stories. And they're I just, mean, I think a lot of people would say, like, no, it's it's because of like they they don't want to throw the money into it or whatever. But I mean, that sort of media representation, it's it's not gonna. It's not a lot of money. It's just getting the word out. I mean, I would have loved to to hear that the Netball World Cup's in South Africa mm. in 2023. Um, and as you say, that just doesn't happen currently. No, it's not happening. Like, I would love to see the ratio of when male sport versus... Yeah, it would be... You know, it's, it's, I've, I've had this conversation as well. Like, how do you fix this? Like... Do you, do you think you start at grassroots level as you said now like just raising awareness and making people realize like this is what's happening um, or do you think it's a, like you throw more I think it's Brazil who equalized pay between the male and the female soccer players um, what what do you think how do you think you solve this the thing like it's a tough and one. knowing that my, like male sport is probably have a lot more financial backing is it's probably more entertaining and they have a lot more sponsors and that's understandable but it's like we need sponsors to actually invest in women in sport because they will be surprised with what we can produce yeah. as a female sport um, but it's just that getting big companies and I know is it Momentum that's backing the they're not sponsoring the the Pratia cricket team but they're sponsoring the female Pratia so it's like we need more sponsorships or companies like that actually backing women in sport. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, they all have their, like, you want that in turn of inv investment. Yeah. Um, so it's a hard thing. one. It's kind of just, but I feel like we can, in terms of media, like getting writing stories. Exactly. That, that's is what the first saying. stop. Yeah. Um, first is the first is the place where you can start. It's not going to cost them, I'm sure it's not going to cost them any money or um, it's going to, it's just writing about it. Yeah. Like getting that exposure, just writing about women in sport. I can imagine that being very frustrating if you like putting everything out there and you just don't feel like you're being recognized the way that. And if you look at females, um, a lot, a whole lot of the cricket players plays in the Australian league and they do well. Like, we are competing with them. So it's not like we're just filling numbers. We're actually doing well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so cricket players go abroad to play there. Um, netball players go abroad oh, to play in different leagues. So there should definitely be something to write about. Yeah. Even if you just write about, I don't know, like because they write about the most random stuff. <laughs> Nowadays, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. It's so unpredictable what will, what will make news and what's viral. and mm, people, but. So, but I, just coming back to that, I feel like media can do more in writing yeah. about. I, I think it's keeping it like they don't need to like force it even like just give it the like sort of attention it deserves. Like this is happening. Mm. It's really cool. Like we've got four people playing in this game. Just like inform us about this, and then as you said, like once once that starts and you get people uh, reading about these things, 
it it it's that classic thing of um, people being very excited about Black Panther when he was the first like African um, yes superhero. Mm. Is that representation now? You're giving that little girl. She she had this dream kind of, but now you're putting a face to that dream and you're mm. putting like a person to that dream. It just makes it a lot more real Definitely. for someone who's chasing it. Yes, and actually seeing and that's one of the things like we know being a like. For me personally, I know and I truly hope that my journey would give hope and inspire South Africans yeah. to know that we are more than able to compete against the Australians um, who have who is a first world country and who has all the all money and, and all of that. But I can back any South African player to go there and compete against. I also say our school system. In terms of our school sport, they can go there and they would run over them. Oh, dominate. Yes, definitely. So like, it's only after that where the big differentiation comes Yes, in. it's only after that because there's not a lot of opportunities for people. Yeah. But our school system is great. Like, yeah, it's, it's very, very competitive different. and that's why it's so good because we have great schools and they all compete against each other, which makes them all better. So we can, we can anytime go and compete against the Australian school teams or their school systems. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. Um, oh, like knowing every time we know, and that's something we're very vocal about, is that when we're abroad, we're not just representing ourselves and our story, but we're representing any South African. So a lot of those Australians or people abroad this is the first time they get to do with a South African and what we stand for and our way of living and yeah. how we treat people. And yeah, so it's like we want to make sure that we um, show them South Africa. And so a lot of them were very, like, they want to know. And there's actually now more people that wanted to come, and especially our mates who want to come and visit South Africa because. They see where we're from and even like social media, if we post. And that's one of the things why, and especially Werner and myself post a lot about South Africa is that we are the window to, your to friends our friends there Australia, to yeah. see what is South Africa about. Yeah. So um, that's kind of our secret mission is to show them this is what it's all about. Well, I'm this not- is how beautiful our country is and... It's not necessary, and a lot of those photos is, isn't necessarily that took on the moment. It's been a few weeks back, but it's just like keeping that up, like showing the world or showing our mates in Australia, or people following us. This is what South Africa is, and this is what you can do here, and this is how beautiful it is here. I think that's very cool that you realize, because I mean, a lot of people would have lived your life and not realize that they are in this position. And I think it's very cool of you guys to realize we've got this opportunity to showcase South Africa because you've got an audience, basically. You've got this opportunity mm. to showcase South Africa to the world. And let's show them, let's show them our best side because Definitely. there's so much negative out there. So let's, let's, shine, let's shine a bit. And I, I don't think, um, knowing Vanna the little bit that I do, I don't think we could have asked for better, better ambassadors between the two of you. I mean, even when I, when I look at your, the things you share, I'm like, I need to get out more because we're in this country <laughs> and we don't we don't appreciate it. And I'll just add something about him is that he so he did it two thousand and and he will never talk about it, so I feel like it's my responsibility. <laughs> two thousand and when was it? Two thousand and nineteen. So then he came over and he did his MBA, Masters in Business Administration in Australia. So it was, and then he won, he was the best in his class, he won the Chancellor's Medal, um, so that year he won all of that, and it was his, and I know he never says it, but I know it was his mission to show the people there that uh. this is what a South African is made of. We are smart, we are well and truly able, we can compete, we can be, um, we can be counted even if we come from, world. yes, we can look at, be look the at best. Elon, our proudest, <laughs> our proudest. Yes, yeah, so it's like, and he won the Chancellor's Medal. He was the best in his class, and I mean, it's it took a lot of hard work. Yeah. He put a lot of hard work in it, but he got through it at the end, and he showed them. It was just to showcase, uh, showcase yes. what we can do. Yeah, I mean that that is very very inspiring. I think, um, and it's cool for me to think 
that you see a future for yourselves in South Africa. As you mm-hmm. said, like you, you know everything that's going on, like all of this uh, working over there and traveling over there. It's nice to hear that in the end, the your vision is still to come, come back, back here and like to, because it's it's that thing of if if everyone if everyone leaves, it's not going to get better ever. Mm-mm. But if if we can keep guys like you two, to to like spend some energy into this place. And there's a lot of people like that. It, there's, there's, there's a lot of people. And the thing is, you often won't hear about them because it's once again that negative news versus positive but um it's just uh, this is just our home this is where we feel this is for eat as well to stay full yeah and you just you can't explain it it's just how you feel you feel comfortable yeah you feel at at ease you feel this is where you have to be and in terms of opportunities and making a difference it's endless here yeah you can Ja, dit is het, jy sê het so baie geleentere en jy kan een verskil maak. Ja, yeah. I just wish that there could be more people with that sort of, um, but you said now there, there are more people, we just, we just don't hear about Yeah, them. I think, I think as well, like the biggest challenge would be, or we also very for like walk to talk, so it's not what you say, but actually action that you take. So it's, in it kind of, it's, it starts at home. And yeah. it starts in your immediate environment, like your community, um, and making a difference there. And people always think, well, how am I going to make a difference? But net in your complex, talk on your claw for school mark. So yeah. it's really just starting with the people around you. And if you change one person's life, and it's not everybody's mission to change somebody's life, but if you can make somebody's life a bit easier, that would be then why would that would you? be great yeah, yes. if you can make someone if you, um, you can just make someone's day a bit better like why definitely would you like to? um <laughs> so it's literally just in your immediate environment and i mean you have that immediate environment so you have that opportunity go and hustle with you it you just have to decide and do it so and like i can talk about all these things but we have to put it in action as well so yeah um yeah we'll see where <laughs> This road lead us. I like the fact that you said like it doesn't take something massive. Like you don't need no. to you don't need to go and start like a children's home or something no. to to make a difference in your community. You can go out and you can with your neighbor or whatever. You can just go introduce. It's so weird to me how people like just don't know. I, I mean, in Joburg, when you meet your neighbors, it's like a weird thing. You can tell yeah. they're, they're uncomfortable. Like it's it's not the norm. Well, over here, it's still, I guess... It's a That's a great thing about Plume, is that... <laughs> the, the small town is... Yes, like, the community feel and that personal relationships you can have. But, yo, we put it in action. Yeah. Yeah, just that great. Thanks a lot, Carla. All right, thank you, Annie. Was it like a conversation? Yeah, so thanks to listening to, to another episode of Onto Something. Um, that was so much fun. Like, we... Every time on our way out, we just start talking again. I mean, Carla, what a class act. Really such, just such a cool person. Um, the way she talks, you can really pick up that she loves what she's doing. Massive passion for it and massive passion for people as well. And uh, feel like we've spent a lot of energy on that. But I hope you enjoyed the episode. And let's see what we're on to next.